Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast, the official podcast of the International Marxist Tendency. I'm your host, Joe Assad. I'm a writer and editor for Marxist.com. I'm a member of the IMT, and I can't think of a more fitting date and subject of our first episode, because the 7th of November, by the New Style calendar, is the anniversary of the Great Russian Revolution of 1917, the October Revolution. And we have with us today to discuss these momentous events, Alan Woods, who is editor-in-chief at Marxist.com, also author of Bolshevism, The Road to Revolution. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's set the scene by talking about the international context. What was going on in the world in the year 1917? Well, that's, that's an important question because... If you just think of the international context of the revolution, uh, use a little bit of imagination, it, it really would seem a, a, an absolutely impossible task to even suggest that it was possible to, to carry out the socialist revolution, particularly in a backward semi-feudal country like Russia, where the working class was a small minority of the population, don't forget. The great majority were, were peasants, who in any case were all, most of them recruited into the army and, uh, and were fighting at the front under terrible conditions, being slaughtered and so on. Uh, Lunacharsky, who later became the first uh, minister, commissar of culture of the, of the Soviet Union, he described it in one of his pamphlets as Europe in the Dance of Death. I think that was quite an appropriate uh, title of, of a terrible... Uh, slaughter in which workers in uniform of different countries were killing each other with bayonets and poison gas and artillery shells. But just think of it, in that kind of situation, the slogan, workers of the world unite, would appear to be uh, somewhat ironic, if not uh, an absolute uh, monstrosity, given the, the, the reality of the situation. And this, of course, was uh, this uh, problem was, was enormously exacerbated in August 1914, by the betrayal of the, the Second International, the Socialist International, as was at that, at that time, which at, at, up until then had been the representative of the organized, the advanced workers of all countries, as a matter of fact, all, all, all Europe, European countries at least, uh, in which the leaders, the reformist leaders of that organization betrayed the cause of internationalism and socialism by supporting the war, supporting their own, their own bourgeoisie, the, the interests of their own imperialist class, which caused, of course, uh, that caused itself. That's t again, it's difficult to imagine the, the the impact of this betrayal. It caused a wave of terrible demoralization and confusion, uh, in, in which the genuine forces of internationalism, international socialism, were reduced to, to a tiny handful. When, in fact, they, they, they tried to gather them together in Switzerland in 1915, a little village called Zimmerwald, you may have heard of, when Lenin looked around the room and saw the pathetic numbers of people present, he cracked a joke. He said that, uh, it seems, comrades, you can put all the internationalists in the world into two stagecoaches, which was uh, quite true, as a matter of fact, at that time. Lenin himself, by the way, was, found himself in exile yet again, not the first time, He'd been in exile before the First World War, but he was again in exile in Switzerland, uh, almost completely isolated from Russia. I mean, at that time, because Europe was divided by war and uh, with the military dictatorships in most countries, it was it was a superhuman effort just to get a letter delivered to, to Russia and to get it uh, replied to. The Bolshevik Party inside Russia, by the way, was decimated by arrests. Uh, its leaders were all imprisoned or put on trial and so on. And it seemed to be, anyone with a, uh, looking at it logically, an absolutely hopeless situation that they were in. Lenin, for example, who was a born optimist, uh, even he, could see, he began to see that revolution was no longer, socialist revolution was no longer an immediate prospect. Now, I'll give you a, 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 a celebrated uh, incident. In January 1917, when Lenin was addressing a meeting of the uh, Swiss young socialists, he actually said words to the effect that he said, well, look, he said, I'm an old man. He wasn't that old, but there you are. That's what he said anyway. 
I'm an old man and will probably never live to see the socialist revolution. It's up to you, the youth, to carry the struggle forward, and so on. Yes, and yet, and yet, and this is a very striking thing. Less than two weeks after making these statements, Lenin received the astonishing news that revolution had broken out in Russia and that Tsar had been overthrown. Absolutely astonishing. Now, you see, this shows something, doesn't it? You know, it shows something. First of all, I must point out that the February Revolution, it was called that, it took place in March according to the the new uh, cat, uh, calendar that was subsequently adopted after the revolution. But the February Revolution was totally unexpected, even by Lenin and the leaders of the Bolshevik Party in Petrograd. In fact, when the uh, women workers, and the women, women, by the way, played a very important role in the revolution, the condition of the masses in Russia was appalling, not just the slaughter at the, uh, at the front, constant defeats, of the Tsarist armies, but also the, the the colossal increase in prices of bread and so on, which meant that many families were going hungry, that women were standing hours on end in freezing conditions in the snow and so on, waiting for a crust of bread. Um, when, when the women workers came, I'm, I'm talking about women workers here, not uh, any clever intellectuals from the universities, but ordinary working class women, when they came to the Bolsheviks in Petrograd to announce that they intended to come out onto the streets to protest about the lack of bread and against the war, the local leaders <laughs> of the Bolshevik party opposed this. Mm. Uh, they were afraid. I mean, they, they, had, their, they had their reasons for it. They, they, were, they were afraid they would lead to a massacre, which was possible on, the past, on past records. But you see, the question is this. Now, here you have... Let's, let's spell it out. What lesson can you draw from this? And there's a very important lesson before we start, before we start to deal with the question of the Russian Revolution. Here is the lesson. Here is a monstrous state, an autocratic state. No, no question of democracy, no rights, no free trade unions, no, no free political parties, and so on and so forth. With, with a, huge, a, a regime with a huge army, the biggest army in the world, uh, as I remember, a huge police force also, and also a very uh, vast network of police spies known as the Ochrana, the secret police, the intelligence services in modern parlance, whose tentacles uh, extended everywhere into all the, the illegal parties and organizations. They were thoroughly penetrated by Tsarist agents. Even the Bolshevik parties not, not generally realized that uh, the Bolshevik party was penetrated up to a very high level. This was only really understood after the revolution when, when the Bolsheviks opened up the police secret archives and discovered, among other things, among many things, they discovered that the leader, if you please, of the Bolshevik parliamentary faction in the Duma before the, the war had been a, a police agent. And therefore all the information that the Bolshevik, what the Bolsheviks and Lenin were, were, were well known to the, to, to, to the police. But the question is this. Despite all of these facts, which would seem on the, on the surface to rule out any possibility of revolution, and this is the argument that's often put against uh, ourselves, against revolutionaries, that revolution in general is impossible because the state and the forces of the state, and so on. yes, but in the moment of truth, and you see this in every great revolution, you saw it in France in the 18th century, and you saw it yet again in Russia. Once the working class is organized and, and mobilized and moves to take power into their hands, no power on earth can stop them. What I'm saying is, and that's the most important thing for our listeners to, to take on board, is this. There is a power in society, there's a force in society, which is more powerful than any state, any police force, any army, any secret police that you care to mention. That's the, that's the force of the, the working class once the workers are organized and mobilized for the purpose of changing society. And to go back to the role of the women, the, the, what the women workers, they played an absolutely key role. They, they ignored, fortunately, they ignored the advice of the Bolshevik leaders in, in Petrograd, came out onto the streets and approached the workers in the factories, calling, the, calling on them to strike and demonstrate, which they did on a very significant date, which is the 8th of March. 
Oh, yes, the 8th, 8th of March, 1917, although, for, as we've said, this was the, according to the new calendar. The old calendar was still called February, and therefore it's called the February Revolution. But on the 8th of March, it actually took place, of 1917, that's the date of the February Revolution, when the, the workers massively responded in a, in a big wave of strikes, demonstrations, fights with the police and so on, and they just overwhelmed the powers of the state. They just overwhelmed them completely. And in the moment of truth, all the tremendous power, military might of this state, which had existed for hundreds of years, found itself suspended in midair. And the February Revolution had begun. Mm. And it's true to say that the Bolsheviks did not lead the February Revolution. It's absolutely <laughs> true. Actually, initially... Lenin, of course, was not present. He was in exile, as I've said. But the local Bolsheviks didn't uh, didn't understand what was happening, really. Even they underestimated, and they were the most advanced elements, of, after all. They underestimated the position entirely. No, the February Revolution was not led by anybody in that sense. It was a spontaneous movement of the working class itself. Nobody told them to do this. Nobody told the women to come out and do what they did. No, no, ordinary, and, and I, I, I emphasize this. This was not made by clever people, clever intellectuals who read the three volumes of Capital, important though that might be. No, no, these are ordinary working class men and women who made up their minds, their minds are concentrated on one idea. We've had enough. We can't tolerate these conditions anymore. And we must do something about it. Mm. And the Russian working class had organizations of struggle, didn't they? They set up the Soviets. And could you talk a bit more about the Soviets? Well, they set up the Soviets precisely because they didn't have anything. Right. There was nothing because of the, the monstrously oppressive nature of the state. There were no real uh, genuine workers' organizations were permitted. But they did have, yes, you're quite right, they did have a tradition, that's the point, Dating back to 1905 and 1906, the first Russian revolution. The dress rehearsal revolution, as it's sometimes known. Yes, that's right. It was a kind of dress rehearsal. Where the masses spontaneously, again, I repeat, nobody told them to do this. You, you can read all the, the, the works of Marx and Lenin and Trotsky and so, which I have done. You won't find any mention of Soviets prior to 1917. No, the, the, nobody told the, the Russian working class to invent Soviets. They spontaneously, by their own cre creative activity, I can't stress this too much, ordinary people, you know, the people that normally play no role in history, in a situation like that, show the most extraordinary ability, creative ability. And they created these organizations by sending, which is a logical thing to do, sending workers, delegates from every factory, every workplace, to, to a central organization, the Soviet. Although the Russian word Soviet means, but Soviet in Russian just means a council or a committee. That's all. That's all it is. And initially, the Soviets in their origin was just that. The Soviet originally was a, a, a generalized strike committee, if you like, a, bro a broad strike committee which, englobed, which, which, which included within its ranks other, other elements from the left parties. And now, of course, here's a difference. Here's a big difference with 1905. The big weakness of the 1905 revolution is that the, the, the Soviets represented the workers, yes, but not the peasants. The peasants moved a bit later, too late actually, to make a difference, and they, they were crushed uh, together with the workers. But in, 19, in 1917, you see, the peasantry, which is not an organized class normally, was organized, and the workers were organized, in the army, in the ranks of this army, which is being slaughtered at the front and subjected to brutal conditions. And therefore, the, uh, the, the organized peasantry was the army, if you like. The army, the army were peasants and workers in uniforms, mainly peasants, actually. And therefore, as a result of their experience, which revolutionized them, they were fed up with the war, they wanted to put an end, an end to the, the slaughter and so on, they uh, joined the Soviets. So you had not workers' Soviets, but workers' and, and soldiers' Soviets, which is, is another word of saying workers' and peasants' Soviets. That's a fundamental difference, and that's, that was a, a decisive element in the, in the equation. So therefore, the February Revolution ended, involved the setting up of, of, the, of the Soviets. That was a decisive fact. And to be a little telegraphic, you have the overthrow of the Tsar, 
You have the establishment of the bourgeois provisional government led by Kerensky, completely accidental figure, behind which lay the power of the capitalists and the landlords, wanted to remain in the First World War. Revolutions are never one-act dramas, and it's not as though you had this steady gradient from February up to the Bolsheviks leading the workers and peasants to power in October. So what occurred in between? Well, you see, uh, in, here's a, a paradox. Trotsky described it in his marvellous book, which I think you should all read, The History of the Russian Revolution. It's, it's a must. In the second did. Yes, but Trotsky in this book, there's a chapter called The Paradox of the February Revolution. There was a paradox at the center of, of, of the February Revolution, and it was this that the workers in February were strong, showed that they were strong enough to overthrow the Tsar, which was considerable, to, to defeat this monstrous state. They succeeded in doing that. But they were not yet conscious enough, let's put it that way, to carry through the revolution to its logical conclusion, which was to take the state power into their own hands. They hadn't yet drawn that conclusion. And that gave the uh, initiative into the hands of certain elements maneuvering at the top, bourgeois elements and other, even, not even bourgeois, even some elements of the old regime. They were involved in, in, in intrigue to place Prince Lvov uh, on the throne instead of the, the Tsar, and some things of this character, you know. Uh, these people, without reference to, the, to anybody, declared themselves the provisional government, but it's a provisional government, government which nobody elected, mm. Uh, which had formed out of thin air, elements were totally unrepresented. You mentioned Kerensky, even Kerensky, who, by the way, was a very right-wing uh, uh, member of the, the so-called Social, Social Revolutionary Party. But uh, even he came in later, actually. Uh, and he was the only one, the only one with, with some kind of relation to the Soviets that, that joined the provisional government. The rest were all bourgeois of, of the worst sort, capitalists, bankers, landlords. Guchkov, Milyukov, and so on and so forth. And a government of this character, of course, could never carry out the things which the mass of the people, people wanted, which, which could be summed up very simply in the slogans of the Bolshevik Party, which was peace, bread, and land. Very simple slogans. By the way, if you think about it, none of those three slogans have got a socialist content. Oh. Peace, bread, and land. That's what the workers wanted. But this government of bankers and landers could never give this. Partly because they were linked to the landlord cl classes themselves, and therefore they weren't going to take action. They weren't going to hand the land to the peasants uh, under any circumstance. Neither could they give peace because they were sold out immediately to the, to the Allies. Russia, as you know, was the ally of the Entente, that's the British and the French imperialists, who, really speaking, were dictating to them. And the, the Entente gangsters, Lloyd George, Poincaré, and the others, they were quite happy with the February Revolution, as long as the provisional government was in control. The, but the, of course, uh, the, this, was, this was it. The problem was, the real power, even in February, was not in the hands of the provisional government at all. The real power, the, the, the power to decide what was happening on the ground, was in the hands of the Soviets. They decided uh, all, all the real uh, de decisions in society. But the problem is this. The problem was a problem of leadership. You see, the Bolshevik Party at that time, you must make it clear, was a very small party. They only had approximately, it's difficult to know the exact figure, the nearest I can get to it, is about 8,000, perhaps. 8,000 in February. In a country, let's not forget, in a country of 150 million, approximately. Okay? And, and therefore, they were, very, they were a small minority originally in the Soviets. The Bolsheviks were. And the masses were always in the first instance when they were just awakening to, to political activity, to, to politics, if you like, always would tend to take the line, the, the road of least resistance, which in this case, and it, it generally is the case, that they, were, they supported the, uh, the reform, what we'd call the reformist leaders, the Mensheviks, and in particular the so-called so social revolutionaries which was allegedly a, a peasant party. It wasn't, in, fa in fact, it was a party led by petty bourgeois, intellectual, student types and so on, and so teachers, village teachers and people of that sort. Uh, but you see, these uh, moderate socialists, as they call them, they had the majority in the Soviets, and they had no intention whatsoever of taking the power. Though the, the Soviets had the power, in effect, 
Nevertheless, they were held back by their leadership. And this led to the, the, an abortion, in effect, which Lenin described graphically in the phrase dual power. If you think about it, in, in all, all societies, there must be a central power, mustn't there? It's the state. And normally there's one state, one power, and it reflects, of course, really speaking, the rule of the, of the, of the, the dominant class, the ruling class. Nowadays, are the bankers and capitalists, they control the state. This is the, the case in Britain, despite the thin veneer of so-called democracy, which is getting thinner and thinner as the days go by, as we see recently with their attitude towards the Gaza war and, dem and demonstrations and so on, they're clamping down. The d democracy is just a fig leaf, actually. It is, and to cover the real dictatorship of the, 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 the big uh, capitalists, the millionaires, and the bankers. Yes, but in a situation like a, a revolutionary situation, as in Russia, it changes. The state, state now is being challenged by a new power, an emergent power, which is the Soviets. And the, the two, if you like, are, are, are challenging each other for power. But you see, the leader, leaders of the Soviets were determined to hand power to the bourgeoisie, to hand power to the liberals, that, that's to say, to hand power to the provisional government. And this, this was the central contradiction, which explains the, the whole process of the Russian Revolution from this point onwards, as a matter of fact. Uh, now, there's another problem here. The Bolsheviks were on the extreme left of the, uh, if you like, the, Demo the democratic parties, to put it, to use that expression. Yes, but unfortunately, they also were paralyzed by their leadership. Lenin, as I said, was is still in exile in Switzerland. And in his absence, the leadership of the party was taken over by, by second-line second leaders like uh, Kamenev and Stalin, who recently returned from, from exile from Siberia. They, they took control, and they immediately steered the party on a rightward course. Uh, to put it uh, bluntly, they, they capitulated, if you like, to what you could call bourgeois public opinion, respectable opinion, and they really speak, they were, they, they were taken in hock. They were taken uh, in control by the, the, the reformists. They tail-ended the reformists, in effect. That's generally the role of what I'd call left reformists, that they tail-end the right-wing reformists. And the right-wing reformists, in turn, tail the bourgeoisie. That's the, uh, the name of the game. Now, Lenin, from, from his exile in, in Switzerland, Lenin was very concerned about it. Say he was concerned... <laughs> To put it mildly, he was very, very angry about it. And he was angrily demanding that the Bolsheviks should break off relations with the uh, so-called moderate socialists, should have nothing to do with them. Stalin, by the way, at that time, went so far as to, as to propose that the Bolsheviks should reunify with the Mensheviks. It's not generally realized, but it's a fact. He went that far in, 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 in his betrayal, if you like. Lenin was fuming. He sent... He bombarded them with letters. They, they now gathered together in a collection which you should read called Letters from Afar. He bombarded the, the, the leaders of the Bolshevik Party with demands that they have nothing to do with other parties, no coalitions, no deals, no, above all, no, no, no unification. That was out. And that the only solution was to advocate that the Soviets should take power into their own hands. Hence the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. By the way, that's a slogan that's not generally uh, understood. You know, Hegel, the great philosopher, dialectical philosopher, once said, but what is known is not, is not necessarily on that account understood. Everyone knows the slogan, all power to the Soviets, but very people understand what it means. Let us rem remember the Soviets at this time was controlled by the reformists by the Mensheviks and SRs. And what Lenin was saying was approximately this. Now, look, we are a minority. We can't take power. And by the way, that was Lenin's position all along. A minority can never take power. I'll come to this nonsense about a coup later on, but that was never the position of Lenin. He understood the need that he had to win the majority. He had to win the majority of the Soviets before he could even pose the question of power in any sense. He, put the, he said to them, well, look, gentlemen, uh, we, we can't take the power. You can take the power. Why don't you? You take the power. 
uh, 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 and then the Soviets can give what the workers and peasants what they want. Peace, bread, and land. Peace, bread, and land, and all power to the troops. You take the power. You know, he was saying to the, the Russian uh, stammers, if you like, <laughs> he was saying, look, you take power, you take power. You can do it, we can, you take the power. And if you do that, he said, actually, he said, if you do that, we, we Bolsheviks will guarantee there'll be no civil war, no violence, and the whole question of power will be, be reduced to, a, to a, a peaceful debate inside the Soviets. He said that. That's again an answer to the nonsense that Lenin was a bloodthirsty monster, monster advocating buckets of blood, which is nonsense. So Lenin manages to return in April. Yes, with difficulty, yes. With much difficulty. Um, all sorts of slander about closed trains and German gold and this sort of thing, yes. which we won't give oxygen today. But how does he go about turning the situation around and putting the Bolsheviks back on the right course? Well, in order to, the, the only way he could get back to Russia was by uh, reaching some kind of an agreement with the Ger German uh, imperialists. It's a fact, because the Entente had no intention of allowing him to, to leave Switzerland, neither the British nor the French, because they knew if he was going to back, go back to Russia, he was going to argue against the war. The Germans, after, after, after some hesitation, the German imperialists thought, well, We've got nothing to lose by letting this man loose in Russia because he'll, he'll disorganize them, which is, to, to an extent was correct. But Lenin imposed conditions. He didn't want to be associated with the German imperialists in, in any way. The nonsense about it being a German agent, that's just a slander. And he made it conditional. He said, look, I'll accept the condition to go on this train crossing German, German control territory on condition it doesn't stop at any station. Nobody's let either on or off the train. Or the in, other, in other words, there can be no question of any contact between Lenin and these, these German gangsters, which they agreed to, agree to in the end. So he got back, anyway, to cut a long story, so he got back to, to Petrograd, and immediately he opened up a public struggle against the policy pursued by Kamenev and Zinoviev, against any deal with the, with the reformists, with the Bensheviks and SRs, and launched, so he, he addressed the workers, even at the, the Finland station, where, the railway station where he arrived, he was met by a delegation of the Soviet leaders with bouquets of flowers and bands. He turned his back on them altogether and addressed the workers and launched the demand, which was an, an, an earthquake of a demand, all power to the Soviets. And that was the position that, he, that was the correct road, which eventually allowed them to take power. How do we build communism? Issue 43 of In Defense of Marxism, the IMT's theoretical magazine, is out now, link in the description, and it aims to answer this question. There's a piece on the trials and tribulations of building the planned economy in the Soviet Republic, an article on the revolution in Soviet theatre, and another on the tragic lessons of the working class's defeat in Germany in 1923. Pick up your issue today. And it was on the basis of these correct slogans, the Bolsheviks were able to develop their authority in the Soviets. These were what became these mass bodies of workers, or the embryo of workers' power. Yes, that's right. I mean, look, for, for the average worker and, or peasant or soldier in the, in the Soviets, the rank and file, not the leaders, the leaders were hopeless, but the rank and file. By the way, the leaders were never elected either. They, they elected themselves. Mm. They just imposed them. They said, we are the Soviet executive, full stop. It's Not like nice. 1905 where they were elected, but that's, that's another story. They represented only themselves, in other words. But the, the rank and file wanted what the, the Bolsheviks were, 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 were demanding, peace, bread, and land. They also didn't understand why their leaders couldn't take power. Why the hell? They said, what the, what's, what's the matter with you? You, you, you should take power. Uh, of course, they, they didn't want to do that. So Lenin, Lenin particularly hammered this point home. He, he won over the majority of the Bolshevik party without much difficulty because the Bolshevik workers were, frankly, a, a bit annoyed at, at, at the position taken by Kamenev and Zinoviev. He won the majority. And then, of course, the whole policy of the party was to, was to press these demands, peace, bread, and land, transitional demands, if you like, and all power to the Soviets. And eventually it got... It, they got first of all they won the majority in Petrograd. Actually, you see what one has to understand also is that the working class is it's the the most homogeneous class in society. But the working class is never a completely homogeneous class. There are more backward workers, more advanced workers, and so on and so forth. Some workers are, are, are quicker to take up 
revolutionary positions, others are more resistant, and so on. So it was in Russia. The most advanced sections of the workers and soldiers, and sailors in particular, the Kronstadt sailors, um, were very open to Bolshevik propaganda, and therefore they were quick, quickly uh, won over. By May, the end of May, June, say, approximately, the, the, the Bolsheviks had the majority in, in Petrograd, and actually, they could have taken power. <laughs> not, not much in Petrograd. Nothing could have stopped them, actually. But the problem is this. The problem is this. Uh, the, 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 the workers, and particularly the sailors, were, were impatient with the delay. Now, they were fed up. This has gone on long enough. They could see the betrayals of the Soviet leaders. They could see, in particular, the reactionary role of the bourgeois provisional government, who they, which they detested. And they wanted to take action. They wanted, actually, they wanted to overthrow the, they wanted to overthrow the provisional government in, in, in June and July. They were pressing for a, a big demonstration, which actually could have turned into an insurrection. And by the way, if it had turned into an insurrection, they could have succeeded, make no, no, make no doubt, make no bones about it. In Petrograd, they had sufficient forces. There's nothing going to stop them. Yes, but, you see, they, th these workers and sailors, they couldn't see beyond, if you like, the, further than the, their own noses in that sense. They couldn't see the general picture in the rest of the country, the more backward provinces, and above all at the front, the soldiers at the front. How would they react? You know, and therefore, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks had a clearer picture. They, they, they understood. If, yes, the workers could have taken power, the, the sailors could have taken power in Petrograd, yeah, but could they hold it? Well, the, well, the, the reactionaries, including the Soviet leaders and so on, would mobilize the more backward provinces and the, the soldiers at the front, telling them the story that the, the Lenin was a German agent and the Bolsheviks were reactionaries and so on. And uh, they would have mobilized the, the, the more backward areas and the front against Petrograd, and Red Pet Petrograd would have been crushed in blood. Mm. And therefore, what you'd have had, the, all that would have been left of the, October, the, of the Russian Revolution would be a glorious failure like the Paris Commune, precisely, mm. which Lenin, did, Lenin didn't want. Trotsky, by the way, had the same position. I haven't got time to deal with that, but from New, New York, he was in exile in America. He published articles putting exactly the same position as Lenin, and when he returned, he, had, he wasn't formally a member of the Bolshevik Party prior to that. As soon as he came back, he immediately joined the party and was, was immediately elected to a position of the highest uh, leadership. Now, there's no time to go through the whole story. It, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, there's this all kind of nonsense spoken by figs and other idiots who claim to be experts on, on, on Russia, which they're not, but they are vicious Vicious uh, counter revolution vicious enemies of, of socialism and communism, and, and of course with the Bolshevik Party. They argue that Lenin and Trotsky were behind these events in, in Petrograd, which is a lie. As a matter of fact, Lenin and Trotsky acted energetically to act as, as, uh, as, uh, what, as a fire hose, if you like, as firemen, to, to, to dampen the, 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 the excessive spirits of the, of the advance workers. The, the, the way that they did it was, was to turn the, the mass demonstration into an armed demonstration under their control and therefore to limit its scope, if you like, just to a demonstration, not to, to attempt to take power, mm. which, by the way, caused them a lot of difficulties because the workers were very, it's difficult to understand. By the way, you get this same process in every, every great revolution, funnily enough, follows the same pattern. You can see exactly the same. If you see the French Revolution, even the English Revolution, which I'm looking at at the moment, it's got the, the same pattern. There comes a point where the most advanced sections are impatient. They want to go a bit. They want to go further than the mass, which is always a mistake. They become impatient. These workers, and particularly the sailors from Trotsky, they were more than impatient. I think they were a bit. Uh, Frankly, a bit suspicious, very suspicious of the Bolsheviks by now. There was a lot of, because they, they, said, they were asking us, well, look, are these Bolsheviks no better than all the other reformers that are preaching to us, you know, holding us back? They were holding them back, and it's just as well that they did, because if they had a bit attempted to, to take power, they would have been crushed. Now, that was shown subsequently, where the detachments from the front were sent against uh, the, the demonstrators in Petrograd. 
There were some losses. Some people were killed. Many people were arrested. And the whole pendulum then begins swinging violently to the right. Mm -hmm. And you have to see here that the, 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 uh, the Russian Revolution was not uh, a triumphal march. It went through all kinds of stages, you know. There were ebbs and flows. There were periods of great advance like February and so on. But there were also other periods of defeat, of tiredness, of exhaustion, of disillusionment of the masses, even of reaction. And th that occurred after the putting down of the July days. Uh, there was a, a, a witch hunt was opened up against the Bolsheviks. Trotsky was put in, in, in jail. I think Kamenev also was in jail. Lenin had to flee to on the instructions of the Central Committee to Finland to save his life. Otherwise, he would have probably, probably been killed if he had fallen into their hands. They smashed the, 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 the Pravda officers and the press and so on. In other words, there was, there was a general counter-revolutionary atmosphere, which led to a strong development then of the right wing, of the, the real counter-revolutionaries, which expressed itself in the revolt of, uh, led by General Kornilov, uh, uh, an open czarist reactionary, in end of August and beginning of September, mm. which openly threatened to overthrow the revolution as, as a whole. You know, I mean, these, these people were rabid reactionaries. They even regarded Kerensky and the, and the provisional government as uh, as extreme revolutionists, you know, that was their position. But of course, Car Cornelia, if, if, and that gave an opportunity to the Bolsheviks. How did the Bolsheviks react? Well, funnily enough, they reacted by offering a united front to the very parties and leaders that were oppressing them, putting them in jail, and so on and so forth. The people that smashed up the, the, the Pravda and the officers. They offered, they said, look, look, don't you understand the central enemy is these people, Kornilov, all workers, whether they're Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, or social revolutionaries, should unite to combat the main enemy, which is Kornilov. Let's join in the fight in action. We don't have to agree on the policies and so on and so forth. Let's keep separate. You know the, the policy of the United Front. You know what it is. Mm -hmm. March separately and strike together. There's no question of doing deals or, over ideas and so on. The Bolsheviks maintain their differences, their principal differences with the others. But in action, they combined in action. And th this enabled them to, uh, uh, a road opened up. To who? To the rank and file workers and soldiers in the, in the Soviets, who hitherto had followed the Mensheviks and SRs, but became completely disenchanted with them, and now looked to the Bolsheviks mm. for, a le for leadership. This was a decisive change. I mean, the way that it was described amongst the Bolsheviks, from what I've read, is they treated... Kerensky as a gun rest to fire at Kornilov and in their sort of responsible uh, beating back of this blackest of counter-revolutionary reaction they found a huge amount of support amongst ordinary workers but you mentioned this idiot Orlando Figs or Figes or whatever the whatever he's called this um, reactionary academic who's poured an ocean of scorn on the Bolsheviks <laughs> and he is not alone amongst bourgeois historians and academics in describing the October Revolution as a coup. It was a coup led by a small group of conspirators. It was anti-democratic and it laid the basis for a brutal dictatorship. Um, is, is this true? Um, was the October first, Revolution a coup? First of all, let's be clear about this. Nobody ever elected the provisional government. Right, as that's you said. That's the first lie. They, 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 and they represented nobody. And by this time, the, any support they might have had, they didn't have much support. Anyway. The only support they had really was with the, the, the moderate socialists in the leadership of the, the Soviets, that's all. But they were increasingly discredited. Now, as for our friend Orlando Figgs, <laughs> I've, I've, I don't know, I've read his big book. You know, in the, in the 1930s, there were, when the webs went to Russia, there was a, a joke circulating. To Russia, to Russia, to have a quick look, home again, home again, write a big book. There we are. But Orlando Figgs didn't go to Russia anyway. But I don't know where, where he went. I debated with him on one occasion. I, I was quite amused, you know. He raised this nonsense about a coup. And I turned to him, actually, I made him an offer, a friendly offer. I said, Orlando, do me a favor, I said. You say that the Bolsheviks were a tiny, unrepresentative minority of conspirators, and they were able to take power by a coup 
in a country of 150 million people. Now, that is really something. I, I tell you what, can you do me a favor? Can you please send me a letter stating how exactly this miracle was achieved? Because I'd like to, if, that, if that's the case, I'll take power in Britain next Monday at nine o'clock. And you're not in power, Alan, so uh, I guess it never came. You no, know, it must be a problem. In, perhaps it's uh, stuck in the post. I don't know. It's arrant nonsense. Arrant complete balderdash. But you see, uh, Lenin made it clear consistently. You could read all his, all his writings, his letters, and so on. From February onwards, there was never any question of the Bolshevik Party trying to take power as a minority. You can't. It's, it's the ABC of communism, if you like, of Marxism. I speak as a Marxist and as a communist all my life. You can't take power as a minority. Long before, before you take power, the prior condition is not the conquest of power. The prior condition for that is the conquest of the masses, which explains all of Lenin's policies from February onwards. Where, where Figs and Co. can't uh, forgive Lenin is that he succeeded. Yeah, it, he succeeded. What is true, he had to flee, to, he had to, flee to, 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 to Finland. And there were problems, by the way. Again, there were problems in the lead, part, part of the leaders of the Bolshevik party. One has to remember that in a situation like this, the, the, the party is under intense pressure, pressure of public opinion, if you like. And some of the weaker leaders are bent to that pressure, particularly Kamenev and Zinoviev. Stalin also, although he was more cautious since he'd burnt his fingers badly in March, but really, he had the same position. They were opposed to the insurrection. You see, Lenin had opposed insurrection in, in, in July because the conditions were, were absent. Now, you see, now the, all the information coming through, there were elections to the Soviets in September. And throughout the month of September, in one, from one pr province after another, one city after another, one village after another, the Bolsheviks were winning the majority. The old Soviet leaders were being removed and replaced by Bolsheviks. Well, the figures are there. It's, 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 uh, it's indisputable. Therefore, having got the, the majority of, of, the, of the decisive layers, Lenin insisted that the time for insurrection had come, and he, he insisted that, uh, that they should not waste time, they should get on with it. Now, Kamenev and Zofia opposed it. They opposed it to the extent, if you can believe such a thing, on the eve of the insurrection, of the October Revolution, Zinoviev published the plans of the insurrection in, the, in, in Gorky's paper, in the public. Imagine, you know. I mean, a bigger act of betrayal you couldn't imagine. Lenin was quite furious. He denounced Zinoviev and Kamenev as strike breakers and demanded their expulsion from the party. Well, you could understand it. What was the action of a strike breaker or worse? But it didn't make any difference when it came down to it because the, 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 the city was very really clear. Trotsky w w was in the Central Committee at the time argued that there should be an insurrection as soon as possible, but he thought that it should be coincide with the Second Congress of Soviets, which is due any day, it was due just around the corner. Uh, the, 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 the reformists were, were compelled to call a, a, a Second Congress of Soviets, in which the Bolsheviks were sure to get a majority. And therefore, what Trotsky's argument was, it's always a good thing, which is true. It's always a good thing from the standpoint of the masses to have legality, some element of legality on your side, you know, legal justification, to prove, yes, that we are the majority and therefore we take the power into our own hands without any delay, which is what they did, to the horror of the Bensheviks and SRs. But they, they were hopelessly beat, beaten. They were driven out. They were defeated oh. tremendously in the votes of the Soviet. And the, so the Soviet then took, uh, took, took power. Now, the question is this. But they go back to our friend Orlando again, you know. He contradicts himself. They all contradict themselves. On the one hand, they argue that Lenin was a bloodthirsty monster and that the revolution was full of buckets of blood and so on. And then in his book, which I read, he actually describes the October insurrection as something resembling a police operation. Can you imagine this? Now, there's some truth in that statement. It's, it's overstated, but... Because the, the, the Bolshevik had, had the, the support of the masses, no two ways about it. It was shown by the results of the elections of the Second Congress of Soviets. However, uh, the actual seizure of power itself was a, a, quite a painless affair. It was, it, actually, it was, insofar as you can have a peaceful revolution, it was peaceful. 
Mm. And that, that contradicts all the nonsense which, the, which our enemies have been uh, churning out for the last hundred years, actually. And the peacefulness of that revolution reflects in large part the fact that nobody was willing to defend the provisional government. Precisely. Precisely that. There was no one willing to give their life for the provisional government. Now, actually, this I'll prove my point in rather, an, a, rather a paradoxical way. Ten years after the Russian Revolution, the great Soviet film director, Isis, Sergei Eisenstein. One of my favourites. Indeed, yes, he's a great... All, all, I hope all our listeners take the trouble to see Eisenstein's films. But he wrote, among his films is a film called October. In this film, there's a very famous scene, which is the, uh, the the seizure of the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace was the former Tsar's former residence, and it was held by the provisional government. So they had, it had to be taken. It was defended to some extent, by, actually by a woman's battalion, actually, in the main. But in any case, um, <laughs> in Eisenstein's film, it's a very dramatic scene, you know, and it's marvellous cinema. You, you get these crowds of workers and soldiers carrying guns, firing their guns, climbing up the gates of the Winter Palace, throwing throwing bombs, falling down dead, and so on and so forth, attacking and so forth. Now, <laughs> it's excellent cinema, but historically speaking, it's, it's on rather weak grounds because, to the best of my knowledge, the, nobody was killed in the seizure of the Winter Palace because they surrendered. Without a fight, there's a scene about where the Aurora, the famous Aurora battle uh, cruiser, rather, I think, on the river, opens fire on the on the uh, Winter Palace. Very dramatic. Yes, it made a lot of noise. What they don't say is that they were firing blanks because they didn't want to damage an, an historical building. A, so the whole thing. I tell you something which is really well. I suppose it's. Not really amusing because people were killed. More people died during the shooting of that scene in Eisenstein's film than died in the in the Winter Palace in 1917. There was an accident. It's not, not surprising if you look at the scene with all, so many explosions taking place. There was an accident and a few people were killed as a result. They died in an accident. Uh, more people were killed there than were killed. Nobody was killed. And that was that was the position, and that was the position of the Russian Revolution, particularly in Petrograd. In, in, there, were, there were some victims in, there were some losses, some violence in, in Moscow, mainly because the Bolsheviks, the local Bolsheviks, had mistakenly adopted wrong tactics, and they they messed it up. One of the questions which occurs sometimes is how did the Bolsheviks prepare for the insurrection? Nine tenths of, of the preparation. Uh, for, for the insurrection had already been carried out in the previous nine months. And that th this was a political preparation. It wasn't a question of gathering guns and ammunition. That was the easy part. because They, they just took it from the armories and the soldiers came over anyway. So that wasn't a problem. The main, problem, the main political thing is that they won over the masses. That was the reason for the success of the insurrection. Trotsky, in particular, Stalin, by the way, admitted this in, in an article. I think that's right. Then he wrote something different in 1924. Yeah, he wrote the opposite in 1924. He wrote the opposite. 1918, I'm referring to, where, where, where Stalin actually says that Comrade Trotsky was re responsible for winning by his, in, by his uh, tireless work or something like that, was responsible for winning over the Petrograd garrison. Well, he was responsible for a damn sight more than that, actually. Trotsky played the, the most outstanding role in the insurrection. Stalin played no role whatsoever. That's a fact. But nevertheless, this is the, this comes to the heart of the matter. The the, the way in which the Bolsheviks uh, prepared for the insurrection was simply by politically winning over the masses and particularly winning over the soldiers, and that guaranteed the success. The rest, of course, was a technical question, which I, I won't even, I won't even bother to go into. It's ABC of seizing the railway stations, the telegraph offices, and so on. But this is a, th these are details which you can read read in a very good book by John Reed, the American author called Ten Days That Shook the World, where he goes into this in some detail. Also Trotsky's great book, History of the Russian Revolution. And also Bolshevism, let's be fair. Yes, by, by a promising young author, yes, that's right. <laughs> Written some years ago, yes, I would recommend that book also. Well... I think that we should have a whole separate episode on, if you like, day two of the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks, 
first year in power, the decrees they carried out, how advanced that government was. But I think to end this discussion, Alan, I'd like to ask you why it is that communists call the Russian Revolution of 1917, the October Revolution, the greatest event in human history. Because I suppose to people who aren't already communists or aren't communists yet, uh, that can seem like a bit of a trite statement because there are many great events in human history. But why do we say this is the greatest? Because it was. There you go. <laughs> there you have it. That's the episode over. <laughs> no, let, let me expand. Let me expand. To elaborate just a little bit for our let listeners' sake. Just, just, just a little bit. Look, why do we say that it was the greatest event in, in, in human history? Well, I'll tell you why. Because here, for the first time in history, if we exclude the... Uh, heroic but uh, tragically defeated uh, events of the Paris Commune, for the first time, the masses, that's to say the millions of ordinary men and working men and women, uh, mobilized to overthrow uh, an oppressive, a monstrously oppressive regime, and actually took power into into, into into their hands. Now, this is a great thing in and of itself, but there's more, much more than this. You see, I know that it's uh, it's not it's not fashionable now it is to say what I'm about to say, but nevertheless, I'm about to tell you the truth. You see, now of course all the enemies of uh, communism and socialism, they try to deny that uh, uh, that the revolution in Russia never accomplished anything. Now this is complete nonsense. As a matter of fact, let me state the the, the facts of the case. Let me spell it out. History has never known such a fantastic transformation as took place in Russia following the Russian Revolution. What do I, why, why do I say this? Well, look, Tsarist Russia, you can, you can read whatever you like. Tsarist Russia was an extremely backward, illiterate, semi-feudal country dominated by other imperialist countries. That's a fact. It was the people in Russia, most of the people couldn't even read or write. Okay. And yet, in a few decades, uh, uh, thanks to uh, a nationalized planned economy, in a few decades, Russia became a a, a powerful, modern, industrial nation. And the proof of that, let's uh, let's deal with the facts of the case, the proof of that came during World War II, during the Second World War, which, by the way, in Europe anyway, in Europe, it was really a titanic struggle between Hitler's Germany, with all the resources of Europe behind him. That's a powerful force. And by the way, Hitler sliced through the French imperials like a, and the British like a hot ni- a knife through butter in 1940. Okay. A, a, a titanic struggle between Hitler's Germany with all the resources of Europe behind it and, uh, mighty, uh, and the USSR. The British and Americans, despite all the war films which you've seen, you can forget about them, were really uh, no more than spectators up until the very end, up to the very end. But the the, the Second World War, Hitler was defeated by the Soviet Union. It's a a fact, despite the fact that in the first phase of the war, because of the monstrous policies of Stalin, which left Russia, left the Soviet Union defenseless in the face of the attack of, of, of the Germans, they lost millions of men. And, and so a lot of their industry was destroyed, and the, the, the war machine was destroyed. And yet, within a, within a space of about 18 months or two years, they actually succeeded in doing something extraordinary, which you could only do in a nationalized planned economy. They dismantled all the industries in the west of Russia, which were vulnerable to German attack, but loaded them onto t- to trains and shipped them east, beyond the Urals where they couldn't be reached by the, Rus- by the German bombers. They reorganized, and within 18 months, the Soviet Union was producing more tanks, guns, and planes than Germany. And that was decisive. That was decisive. And therefore, the Soviet Union was able to defeat Germany. The the Red Army staged the biggest advance after the Battle of Kursk, the biggest tank, and the Battle of Stalingrad, but the Battle of Kursk in particular, the biggest uh, tank battle in history. They staged the biggest offensive in history, and... uh, and if, and of course, at that point, Churchill was uh, and, and, and Roosevelt they were delaying the, the opening of the Second Front, hoping that that Russia would be defeated. Actually, 
when they saw that the Red Army was advancing, they hastily organized this uh, attack, this D-Day, and they opened up the second front as, as quickly as possible. If they hadn't have done that, they would have met the Red Army not in Berlin, but on the English Channel. <laughs> you know, if not uh, if not uh, the Atlantic Ocean, nothing could have stopped it. Now this is this is a proof. Incidentally, I'll give you another proof of the superiority of a nationalized planned economy, which they tried to deny, but uh, they can't deny it. I'll tell you why. Look, during the Second World War in 1940, when Britain really was up against it, when it had its back against the wall after the fall of France, and was hourly expecting a German invasion, right? What did they do? Did Churchill say, did they say, did they say well, uh, no, free enterprise, everyone do what they like, market, free market economics. Yeah, invisible hand of the market. The invisible hand of the market and so on. No. They nationalized certain industries. They centralized. They introduced measures of planning, not complete planning, because that's impossible in a capitalist business. But they, they, they used, they, they imitated, if you like, the methods of the Soviet Union. Why? Only for one reason, because it gives better results. QED. Simple. You know, and it was shown by the Soviet Union. Furthermore, bear in mind that during the war, the Soviet Union, which bore the, they, they bore the brunt of the terrible brunt of the war, uh, uh, I think ab about 27 million Russians lost their lives during the war, and the Soviet economy was devastated. Industry was devastated. Nobody, no country suffered dev devastation like, like the Soviet Union. And yet, in, within a couple of decades, they managed to rebuild everything and then again, they became a, a developed, advanced industrial nation. And by the way, you can see the potential of a, plan, a nationalized planned economy in one thing, in the Soviet space program. And it's not for nothing. I remember distinctly, I can remember, remember distinctly when the Sput, first Soviet Sputnik was launched in the late 1950s. The world was astonished. They succeeded in putting the first satellite into space, and subsequently they succeeded in putting the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, I remember that too. You know, this this shows, shows, if you like, gives, gives you a glimpse of the enormous potential of a nationalized planned economy. And by the way, even as late as the 1980s, the CIA, even the CIA had, had to admit that the Soviet uh, space program was many years ahead of the United States, even at that time. Incidentally, even now, I notice that they, I don't know if they do it now because of the war in the Ukraine, but up until very recently, they were still using Russian uh, rockets to, to launch satellites into space. That's the Americans and the Europeans. Now, it is true that, of course, there was a, a reaction against Bolshevism, if you like, against the October Revolution, carried out by Stalin and the bureaucracy. The reason for that, of course, was the isolation of the Soviet Union in conditions of terrible backwardness. But that really is another story which we'll have to discuss. And perhaps we'll bring you back uh, to talk about time. it uh, in another episode. But for yeah. now, Alan, uh, for now, Alan, uh, I just want to thank you very much because I think that was a fantastic introduction to the Russian Revolution. Once again, heartily recommend all of the texts that Alan mentioned. I'll put them in the episode description, links to where you can read and purchase them. And... This is the first episode of our new podcast, The Spectre of Communism, but we'll be back next Tuesday and every Tuesday after that with a brand new episode with a different speaker dealing with different aspects of communist history, theory and analysis. So for now, that's been The Spectre of Communism. I'm Joe Attard. Alan, thanks again. Okay, my pleasure again. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>